Few things in human experience are more universal than money. People live for it, die for it, kill for it, lie, cheat, and steal for it, risk their health, their homes, their possessions, their families, their friendships, their careers, and even their eternal destiny for it. We even joke about it. One comedian said, money isn't everything, but it does keep you in touch with your children. Then I heard Tim Conway crack, we haven't seen the kids much anymore since we put the ATM in the front yard. The truth is probably closer to what Will Rogers once said, too many people spend money they don't have to buy things they don't want to impress people they don't like. A lot of truth in those words. Benjamin Franklin, the American patron saint of proverbial wisdom, put it this way. Money never made a man happy, nor will it. There is nothing in its nature to produce happiness. The more a man has, the more he wants. Instead of filling a vacuum, it creates one. If it satisfies one want, it doubles and triples that want in another way. That was a true proverb of the wise man. Rely upon it. Better is little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. Quoting right out of the book of Proverbs. Now, some of you may have heard that phrase, money is the root of all evil. You heard that one before? You might think that's in Scripture, but it's not really. What Scripture says in 1 Timothy 6.10 is the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Money in and of itself is not bad. Money is not the problem. We need money to buy and to sell to meet our individual needs. Money matters. Problems come because of our individual and our cultural attitudes toward money and our inefficiencies in handling our finances wisely. Chuck Swindoll writes, Few grinds in life are more nerve-wracking and energy-draining than those growing out of financial irresponsibility. Many are the headaches and the heartaches of being overextended. Great are the worries of those, for example, who continue to increase their indebtedness and spend impulsively or loan money to others indiscriminately. To the surprise of no one, the sayings of scriptures having to do with money are numerous. Solomon's words have been around for centuries, available for all to read. And when you attempt to categorize them, you realize just how varied are the subjects that have to do with financial matters. Solomon's sayings cover a broad spectrum, including getting money, whether earning it or inheriting it, releasing money by spending squandering, loaning, or giving, investing money, saving money, handling money wisely. The synonyms used are many. Money, wealth, riches, lending, borrowing, spending, giving, losing, silver, gold, plenty, abundance, wants, poverty, and a half a dozen others. So as we come uh, through the book of Proverbs, we come to this matter of money. It's an important issue. It's an integral part of our lives. Money indeed matters. We spend most of our hours, our waking hours, making money, and then we spend the rest of it spending it, right? <laughs> you know what the number one issue of married couples? It's not infidelity. It's money. Money splits friends, families, business partners, and yes, even churches. Even more than this, our actions and our attitudes towards money reflect something deeper about ourselves. One author put it this way, Show me your checkbook and I'll tell you something about your faith. How we use our wealth is a clear-cut indicator of what we think is important. Nothing announces our priorities more sharply than how we open our wallets and our checkbooks. Though it's hardly a textbook on bookkeeping and economic theory, the Bible is the most important book on money that we possess. 
It tells us where it comes from, what we should do and should not do with it, and why we have it. So with that in mind, let's see what the Bible has to say about money. The first truth we see in the book of Proverbs is the principle of reliance. No verse says it better than Proverbs 11.28. Whoever trusts in his riches will fall, but the righteous thrive like a green leaf. Now I want you to notice, Solomon is not down on money in that first line. He's talking about people who trust in it, who rely on it. It's where they find their security and their satisfaction. Those are the folks that Solomon says are in trouble. Jesus taught a parable that reflects this in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12. Luke, chapter 12. Beginning in verse 16. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop, he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and then I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. He thought Dairy Queen came up with that one. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? And Jesus concluded with these words, This is how it will be for anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich toward God. Again, it's not the material things. It's not the wealth that's the issue. It's what we do with it. It's our attitudes and our actions about it. This man was relying on his wealth to carry him through for many years. And he wasn't realizing that his life was going to end very quickly. And he hadn't given any thought to eternity. You know, we face a similar temptation in our society. If you take any piece of currency, any coin, any bill, you will find the phrase, in God we trust that I really think for many Americans it should really say, in this God we trust. Many people are putting their faith in the almighty dollar instead of almighty God. And that's the principle of reliance that Solomon is talking about in the Proverbs. Don't rely on it. Don't find your security and your satisfaction in it. That should only be found in God. The New Testament counterpart to Solomon's words we read earlier in 1 Timothy 6, verses uh, 6 through 10, and then 17 through 19. I'd like to go back to verses 17 through 19. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant and not to put their hope in wealth. In other words, don't rely on it, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up for themselves a treasure as a firm foundation for the coming age, so they may take hold of life that is really life. We think that to live it up means we've got it all. People think that Hitting the lottery and having millions of dollars is going to solve all my problems. I'm going to be happy for the rest of my life. But you know, it's been documented. A large number of people who win the lottery and have millions of dollars find that it just brings millions of problems. And oftentimes their life becomes a train wreck. The money didn't solve anything. It created problems for them. Proverbs 18, verses 10 and 11, give us an interesting couplet on the subject. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. The wealth of the rich is their fortified city. 
they imagine it an unscalable wall. I've heard verse 10 used a lot by itself. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. And that's true. But if we leave off verse 11, we can misinterpret those words. The wealth of the rich is their fortified city. We think, oh, well, that's where their strength and security is. But it's not. Look at the last line of that verse. They imagine it's an unscalable wall. See, these two verses belong together. Verse 10 is a fact. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. That is something we can rely on. But the wealth of the rich, they think is their fortified city. They imagine that it's an unscalable wall, but it really isn't. They're putting their reliance on something that's unreliable. They're putting their trust in something that is not trustworthy. Verse 10 is fact. Verse 11 is fiction. The righteous man of verse 10 is trusting in fact. The rich man in verse 11 is trusting in fiction. One final passage on the subject is in Proverbs 23, verses 4 and 5. Solomon writes, Do not wear yourself out to get rich. Have the wisdom to show restraint. Cast but a glance at riches, for they are gone. For they will surely sprout wings and fly off to the sky like an eagle. Boy, if there's ever a verse meant for our society, this is it. I mean, how many people do you know are wearing themselves out just to get rich? They devote their whole lives to it. And in the end, what do they have to show for it? Solomon uses the imagery of uh, sprouting wings and flying away like an eagle. Now how, how appropriate is that? You find an eagle on a lot of our currency as well. <laughs> Maybe that's a warning to us. It'll quickly fly away. You know, how many people have been tempted by some get-rich-quick scheme and they end up losing the little bit that they have? We're putting our trust in the wrong place. Money is not evil, but it's when we put our reliance on money and the things money can buy, we're missing the mark. Jesus said in Matthew 6.33, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these other things will be added to you. Say, what are all these other things? Well, if you look in the verses before, He's talking about what we will eat, what we will wear, where we will live, the necessities of life, the things money can buy. Jesus said, you seek first God's kingdom and He'll make sure... Your needs are satisfied when we rely upon Him. Now, the second truth we find in the book of Proverbs is the priority of responsibility. The Bible teaches that God is the source of all things. Whatever we enjoy in this life comes from His hand. But He doesn't give us material goods and wealth to spend foolishly or selfishly. He expects us to be responsible with it and responsible in the pursuit of it. Proverbs 10, verse 2 announces, Ill-gotten treasures are of no value, but righteousness delivers from death. There are plenty of ways of getting rich, illegally or immorally, but it won't last. It has a way of disappearing. And in the hour of death, it won't buy you one more minute of life. But righteousness, on the other hand, delivers from death in at least two ways. It preserves someone from the perils that can lead to a, a premature death. Or as an outward evidence of a new birth, it shows that one has eternal life. How much better to invest in eternity than in things of this earth that won't last? Now, one thing you'll often find in the Proverbs is a statement, better this than that. 
It's a way of comparing and contrasting. And we see this in several verses placing responsibility over dishonesty. Chapter 15 and verse 16. I think this is the verse Ben Franklin was referring to earlier. Better a little with the fear of the Lord than great wealth with turmoil. Very next verse, better a meal of vegetables where there is love than a fattened calf with hatred. In the next chapter, chapter 16 and verse 8, better a little with righteousness than much gain with injustice. And then in chapter 19 and verse 1, better a poor man whose walk is blameless than a fool whose lips are perverse. Now we've mentioned this in other messages in this series. The end doesn't justify the means. We might say to ourselves, oh, when I get all this money, I'm going to give to the church, I'm going to give to missions, I'm going to help the poor, I'm going to do all these good things, so it's okay if I get the riches in a less than holy way. That doesn't work. We cannot break God's law in order to fulfill God's word. And so how we acquire what we gain is important. And God wants us to be responsible. He wants us to do it in the right way. An unscrupulous man may rake in the bucks, but he and his family pay in other ways. Consider these contrasting Proverbs. Proverbs 15, 27. A greedy man brings trouble to his family, but he who hates bribes will live. And then over in chapter 19, verse 17, He who is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will reward him for what he has done. Remember from the words of Jesus, If you give a cup of cold water in my name to the least of my brothers, you've done it unto me, and you will receive a reward. When we are responsible in our actions, God rewards us. When we are not, it usually comes back to bite us. Now, before we leave this subject of fiscal responsibility, there's a matter that's mentioned several times in the book of Proverbs that I think warrants our attention. In the King James Version, it uses the word surety five times. And I don't know about you, but I haven't used that word probably in my life, unless I'm reading the King James of Proverbs. The NIV translates it security. I'm not even sure that really gives the picture of what's going on here. So consider chapter 6, Proverbs chapter 6. We're going to take a look at verses 1 through 5. Proverbs chapter 6. My son, if you have put up security for your neighbor, if you have struck hands in pledge for another, if you have been trapped by what you said, ensnared by the words of your mouth, then do this, my son, to free yourself, since you have fallen into your neighbor's hands. Go and humble yourself, press your plea with your neighbor. Allow no sleep to your eyes, no slumber to your eyelids. Free yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter, like a bird from the snare of the fowler. What's he talking about there? You notice that he said, when you put up security for another, when you strike hands in pledge for someone else, What we're talking about here is taking on responsibility for someone else's loan. In Proverbs 11.15, He who puts up security for another will surely suffer, but whoever refuses to strike hands and pledge is safe. Chapter 17 and verse 18, A man lacking in judgment strikes hands in pledge and puts up security for his neighbor. And then in chapter 20, verse 16, take the garment of one who puts up security for a stranger, hold it in pledge if he does it for a wayward woman. And you also find that same words 
in chapter 27, verse 13. What is Solomon talking about here? He's warning against being held accountable for another person's debt. You're making yourself liable that if they don't pay it back, you have to. Now, we don't call that surety today. We don't even call that security. What do we call that? Co-signing for a loan. If you haven't done it or been on the receiving end of it, you've probably heard of it anyway. And Proverbs is very clear about this practice. Don't do it. You say, but why not? Why shouldn't I help somebody out in this way? I like what Derek Kidner writes in his commentary on Proverbs. Scripture doesn't banish generosity. It's nearer to banish gambling. And he goes on to explain, that is, a man's giving should be fully voluntary. Its amount determined by him. For then its effectiveness can be judged and competing claims on him assessed and not wrung from him by events outside his control. Even to the recipient, an unconditional pledge may be an unintended disservice by exposing him to temptation and the subsequent grief of having brought a friend to ruin. The New Testament never assures us that God will underwrite every spiritual escapade we embark on. Materially, too, the New Testament shows us Paul accepting Onesimus' past liabilities, but not his future ones. What happens is, when we're co-signing for another, when we're putting ourselves out there, we're putting ourselves at risk, because if that person doesn't pay, you have to. We may be encouraging them to buy something they really can't afford and don't really need, and just getting themselves deeper in debt. We may be encouraging them to be irresponsible financially. And we may end up ruining that relationship because if they cannot pay and it ends up on us, then you have that awkwardness every time you come together. Even if you're not holding it against them, they hold it against themselves. And you may end up ending a relationship over that. So in all of our financial dealings, we need to give priority to responsibility. Just remember, God owns it all. He just allows us to enjoy His goods for a time. Often in church we call this stewardship, which is sometimes translated give money to the church. It means a whole lot more than that. It's how we spend all of our money. We can't say, okay, I'm going to give God 10% and the 90%. I can spend any way I want. That's not stewardship. Stewardship is God is going to have call us into account and say, what did you do with all of the things I blessed you with? That's the responsibility he calls for. And stewardship's not an option. <laughs> We're a steward of God's goodness to us whether we want to be or not. And we are going to be called into question, and he's going to say, what did you do? You're either a good steward or a bad steward. You can't not be a steward if you are a follower of Christ. So be responsible. And then finally, I want to address the prosperity of the righteous. Proverbs 10.16 says, The wages of the righteous bring them life, but the income of the wicked brings them punishment. Now don't confuse life here with eternal life. There's no way we earn eternity in heaven. Solomon is speaking here of the necessities of this life, whereas the wealth of the wicked brings only trouble. If you go down in that same chapter, chapter 10, verse 22, the blessing of the Lord brings wealth, and he adds no trouble to it. Now let me remind us again that the Proverbs are written as general principles about life not hard and fast guarantees of health and wealth. I know if you turn your television on and see a lot, not all, but a lot of the preachers that are on TV, they will tell you that it is God's will that you always be healthy and wealthy. Now, some of you might have noticed my tie this morning. It's got various forms of currency on it. Some of these I have never seen before. Did you know they had a $1,000 bill? I sometimes call this my televangelist tie because it's all about money for them. 
I'm thinking that somewhere subli subliminally it is stitched in here, send me your money. Because that's what it all seems to be. And they try to sell you, quite literally, on this idea that if you're really following God, and if you really have faith in God, you'll be wealthy. I've heard these guys say, God gives you a blank check, and you can just write whatever you want on it. Name it and claim it, and God has to give it to you. That is garbage. That is not what Scripture says at all. And yet people get sucked into it. You know, these guys will say, send me $100 and God will send you 1000 Well, then why don't you send me 100 and God will send you 1000 Why doesn't it work that way? No, it only works one way. You've got to send them your money. And they'll get on there and beg and plead and say, oh, they're going to shut the lights off if you don't send your money. Well, you must not have enough faith then, right? You know, you're telling us that if we don't have faith, that's why we don't have money. We're not trusting God enough. Well, what about you? You're begging for it. And I'm going to be very honest with you. This is why I hardly ever preach about money. Because of what so many preachers, not just on TV, I've, it happens in the local church as well. They'll get up there and beat the drums and try to create guilt trips and, oh, you got to give more, you got to give more. God takes care of things. And I'll be honest, that, that it has kind of made me gun-shy when it comes to talking about money at all. Thank God this church is so responsible and has given far beyond any expectation. Not only have our needs been met, but we're able to be generous and be giving to missions and giving to other ministries. We don't need the constant harassment about send money, send money, send money. I thank God for that because I wouldn't do it anyway. We just go without. And we haven't had to because God provides. And we are a living example of that. But be careful about these guys that will try to twist Scripture and to say that, you know, they'll use some of these very verses out of Proverbs and say, see, God wants you to be rich. No, God wants you to be saved. God wants you to have a relationship with Him. And sometimes we are the closest to God when we're in the most trouble. Sometimes we have to rely on God more. Our faith grows when we don't see where we're going to get our next meal, how that bill is going to get paid. And the Lord comes through when we rely on Him. If we rely on ourselves, it might be another story. Sometimes the scripture speaks of prosperity in ways that seems backwards to our materialistic mindset. Consider Proverbs 11, verses 24 and 25. One man gives freely and gains even more. Another withholds unduly but comes to poverty. A generous man will prosper. He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. You know, that goes against the grain of our capitalistic thinking but when you give you actually gain it's when you try to hold on to it and hoard it that you lose it jesus even said that about life he who saves his life will lose it but he who loses his life for my sake will find it it's a backwards way of thinking but it's really a glorious paradox we enrich ourselves by being generous. We impoverish ourselves by laying up treasures on earth. What we save, we lose. What we give, we have. Jim Elliott was a missionary back in the 1950s. Gave his life on the mission field. And probably the best known quote from him was, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Think about that. We can't keep it forever. Paul said in 1 Timothy, we brought nothing into this world, we'll take nothing out of it. You'll never see a hearse pull in a U-Haul because you can't take it with you. So why not invest in what's eternal and that's in the lives of others, in the glory of God. One other preacher very insightfully 
said, everyone tithes, either to the Lord or to the doctor or the dentist or the garage repairman. And then that's the truth. I, I, I'll admit it. I've lived this. You know, you think, well, you know, I'm saving towards something, you know. I, I really can't afford to give to the church. So you know, saving this money for something special, and then the car breaks down. Or, you know, you got to go to the doctor, the dentist, money's gone. Be responsible, and God rewards that. Just remember, money is only a small ingredient in wealth or poverty. A person may be rich in material goods, but have nothing in wisdom. In Proverbs, great riches is never measured by money. And nor should we automatically equate economic wealth with emotional and spiritual well-being. It is strange how so many people live under the delusion that a fat bank account makes possible the best things in life. It really does no such thing. Now, don't misunderstand. If God has blessed you materially, don't be ashamed of that. Don't feel guilty if God has blessed you. He has blessed you so that you can bless others. And I firmly believe, though I can't put a chapter and verse to it, that God blesses those whom he trusts to take that blessing and bless others with it. Maybe the reason why some of us never seem to get ahead is because God knows that if we did, we'd blow it anyway. Again, I can't quote chapter and verse on that, but it seems to work that way. But remember, what we call the good life in our society is not necessarily the true life. That's not life that's truly life, as Paul concludes in 1 Timothy 6. Money will only buy things that are for sale. Happiness, a clear conscience, freedom from worry, that's not among those things. Money can be used to buy lovely and comfortable homes, pleasure vacations, delightful works of art, but the priceless things of life are not for sale. And you can be rich and not have hardly any money in your bank account. You may not have the grandest house. You may not drive the newest vehicle. You can be rich in what really matters in the eyes of God. There are many more passages in the Scripture that speak of the prosperity of the righteous, but I want to conclude with a warning. The book of Proverbs falls under wisdom literature in the Old Testament. It's something akin to our philosophy. Proverbs deals in generalities, not guarantees. It's what usually happens, not what automatically happens. And even within the category of wisdom literature, we can't take the principle of prosperity and say that it's always a sign of God's favor. Look at Job. Job lost it all. Is it because he didn't believe in God? No. Is it because he was being punished for something he had done wrong? No. He lost it all, in fact, because he was so faithful to God. And he maintained his faith. We need to do the same. Again, I just take the time to say this because there's so many false teachers out there I like to use the old-fashioned word heretics because that's what they are. To try to sell us on some prosperity gospel. That's not how God works. Jesus said in Matthew 19, 29, Everyone who left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. It doesn't mean you're going to get it in this life. You probably won't. Because it's so much better in the next. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where thieves can't break in and steal and moths don't come in and, and destroy. It doesn't rot. That's how to be wealthy toward God. No, money isn't everything. It's not even the most important thing in life. But money matters. It's essential in our world. And God provides us with what we need and able for ourselves to exist and to enrich others. 
He expects us to be responsible and righteous in our dealings with it. And he'll ultimately hold us accountable for how we use what he has given to us. I think the bottom line in this whole subject, the key is possessing money without money possessing us. We can possess material things, but when material things possess us, we're in trouble. It's not a matter of how much you have. It's a matter of how we think about it. And God's word is very clear, particularly in the book of Proverbs. Not to put your trust in riches, put your trust in God. And he'll take care of the rest.